The Golden State Warriors are NBA champions for the fourth time in eight years. But the team also made headlines off the court during the finals, and not just because of Draymond Green's podcast either. As the Dubs marched towards adding another glorious chapter to their modern dynasty, reports emerged that rivals around the league have taken issue with Golden State's spending. Well, as the champagne-soaked Warriors bask in the glow of another championship, perhaps those rivals should get off their asses and start building and spending like the Warriors do to keep up with them, rather than sitting around and complaining about the chance. As Golden State played in its sixth finals over the last eight seasons, ESPN's Zach Lowe reported that rivals were grumbling about the Warriors' quote-unquote spending advantage. Make no mistake, the Warriors do spend. Between player salaries and luxury tax payments, the Warriors spent an NBA record $346 million in 2021-2022. And that figure should only increase in the coming years, as rising star Jordan Poole is extension eligible this summer, while defensive guard Gary Payton II and underrated starting center Kevon Looney are set for 2022 free agency. In addition, Steph Curry, Draymond Green, and Klay Thompson are all under contract through at least 2024, while Andrew Wiggins is set to earn more than $33.6 million next season. The NBA's tax penalties increase per dollar spent the further a team blows past the tax threshold, with additional taxes for those deemed repeat offenders, clubs that spend into the tax in three of four seasons. With all those stars set to earn big bucks next year, and the Warriors set to pay that significant repeater penalty, the team's total bill on player expenditures could approach half a billion dollars in 2022-2023. But while rivals around the league find those figures worth grumbling over, Warriors president and general manager Bob Myers sees things differently. You should be allowed to spend on your own players. I mean, we drafted a lot of these guys. We developed them. I mean, exactly. it's not like we went out and signed all these guys as free agents and built some team that way. We drafted, you know, Larry Riley's guys drafted Curry. I mean, we, I was here when we drafted Clay. We drafted Draymond. We drafted Poole. We traded for Wiggins. Nobody wanted Wiggins. I mean, nobody was saying anything then. Everybody's got equal playing uh, field in the draft. Everybody drafts, usually, unless you trade your pick. So it's an opportunity where it's not about big, small markets, not any of that. It's about how well you do with that. And then it's about development. Though his view is obviously colored by blue and yellow lenses, Myers has a point. Even the acquisition of Kevin Durant in 2016 stemmed from the fact Golden State had built a team and culture worth Durant's time with an assist from the good fortune that came with having Curry on a team-friendly contract signed before he became a full-fledged superstar. If the Warriors do have a competitive spending advantage, it's because they've run their organization better than rival teams around the association have. Building the type of homegrown powerhouse worth the price the champions are now paying, and because their rivals are less willing to spend, not because they're incapable of doing so. For all the talk of super teams and player empowerment, the NBA actually rewards teams for finding and developing homegrown talent more than other pro sports leagues around North America do. That's the beauty within the complexities of the NBA's salary cap. In contrast to hard caps in the NFL and NHL, where front offices are forced to break up well-built teams when homegrown talent becomes too pricey, the NBA's soft cap allows clubs to spend beyond the cap when retaining their own players, as long as those teams have the stomach to do it. Let go! <laughs> Joe Lacob's Warriors have proved they have that intestinal fortitude. Golden State's truly willing to win at all costs, and it can't simply be chalked up to spending advantages, market size, or whatever other excuse their loser rivals will try to sell you. It's true that the size of a team's market can impact local television rights deals, ticket revenues, and advertising partnerships, among other revenue streams. But all that doesn't necessarily equate to a competitive advantage in pro sports the way it would in a standard business setting. At least it shouldn't. If an NBA owner views his franchise strictly as a business that should yield a yearly profit, then sure, spending based on what a team can realistically earn in a given market makes sense. But that ignores the fact sports leagues have a revenue sharing model, which in the case of the NBA, sees non-taxpaying teams subsidized by the taxpayers. 
That approach also ignores the obvious revenue streams associated with building a team good enough to play deep into the playoffs every year. Ultimately though, the realities of market-related revenue ceilings shouldn't even matter in a league contested by a plethora of billionaires for whom sports teams are merely toys. They have a car and a house and a family and it's all paid for, fuck you. Can there be such a thing as small market problems or spending disadvantages in a league where the smallest market franchises are owned by people worth $15.4 billion and $3.8 billion respectively? The Milwaukee Bucks play in the league's fourth smallest market and the smallest in the Eastern Conference, but the team's three primary owners have a combined net worth of $8 billion. Letting P.J. Tucker walk as a 2021 free agent due to tax concerns rather than keeping a championship team together is evidence of a small market mentality, not any tangible small market disadvantage. The same goes for the Nuggets, whose willingness to spend is an open question around the league right now, despite the fact the team is owned by a family worth tens of billions. With their hands in the reigning Super Bowl champions, an English Premier League institution, and Walmart. Look, if it's rival general managers grumbling about Meyer's spending power, they should take it up with their stingy owners. Or simply scout, draft, and develop better until they build a team worth keeping together at an astronomical expense. If it's the owners themselves who've taken issue with the precedent set by the Warriors, then perhaps they should look into selling their franchises, for astounding profits by the way, to prospective owners who, like Lakeup, might run those teams with the sole purpose of winning and the money will follow. Back in 2016, as Golden State marched toward an NBA record 73 wins, before blowing a 3-1 series lead in the finals, Lakeup's Warriors once again drew the ire of rival executives when he proclaimed his team to be light years ahead of the competition. At the time, Lakeup was referencing the Warriors roster, organizational structure, and planning, among other things. But it turns out that his real advantage in a league of magnets worth unfathomable sums of money might have simply been his willingness to actually spend his billions. Thanks for watching. If you like this video and want to see more content like this, be sure to hit that subscribe button.